I am recording now. Hey everyone, thank you so much for joining us. Uh, my name is Danielle Blunt. I use she, her pronouns. I am one of the co-founders of Hacking Hustling uh, and I organize with them currently. So we'll, Milka and Daly will get into this in more detail, but just with all of the protests going on and seeing the sort of fear mongering campaign of Pride Fall, we thought that it was really important at this time to share some resources so folks can uh, feel empowered to take actionable steps to making themselves feel safer online and in the streets. Um, so Hacking Hustling is an organization that works at the intersection of social justice and technology and is um, an organization of sex working people, sex working adjacent people. And we really like feel free to follow up with me with any ideas for future workshops. We really want to make sure that we're meeting the needs of the folks who we're in community with. Um, and if you have any questions, I'll be monitoring the chat. Uh, so feel free to use the Q&A portion of the chat for specific questions that you want to make sure are addressed. And I'll do my best to take note of what's going on in the chat and sort of um, interjecting if uh, anyone needs anyone to slow down. Um, something else that's really important to us at Hacking Hustling is that this information is accessible and not just, I feel like a lot of the time at, uh, a lot of us aren't super techie, so if there's a word you don't understand, please speak up. Uh, you can message me directly if you don't feel like putting it in the public chat, and I'll make sure that we slow down and define whatever it is. I'm done now, so. Awesome, I can go over the agenda really quick. I'm just gonna share my screen. Cool. So obviously we're here to, to lock down our shit. Um, doxing prevention, and we'll go over what doxing means if you're unclear. It will be both me, myself, and Daly going over the topics today. Um, Blunt will be our moderator. So uh, we'll go over the intros in a bit. What is doxing? What is Pridefall? Um, daily spiel, which will be like general advice. I will also go over Twitter harm reduction, doxing prevention, as well as Instagram. And then we will wrap up with a Q&A, closing statements, and sharing resources. So that will be our agenda for the day. Awesome. Do you guys want to both intro introduce yourselves and tell you a little bit about your background? Sure. Daily, do you want to go first? Uh, yeah, sure. I'm happy to. So my name is Daly. Uh, I use she, her pronouns, and I am also one of the, uh, I guess I'm one of the founding members of Hacking Hustling. And yeah, uh, yeah. <laughs> uh, and my title there is Data Witch, and I'm a, also a staff technologist at the Electronic Frontier Foundation. Um, that's me. Awesome, thanks Daly. I'm Milka Halili. I am currently a software engineer and instructor at General Assembly. Um, previously, I've been a sex worker. I predominantly did work at kink.com with mostly queer women and that really informed um, basically the rest of my life. Um, sex workers have made me like the trans person that I am today. So, oh yeah, by the way, my pronouns are they, them, he, him prefer they them lately and yep just excited to share all this information with y'all awesome let's take a look at the agenda and see what we're doing first cool so uh do we want to do a little bit a, a little bit more in detail of why we're doing this why we're doing this now what is doxing what is pride fall before daily get started. Either of you can feel empowered to chat about that. Yeah, I can go over what doxing is and like the most simple terms. It's essentially when somebody with bad intent looks for your private data with the intent to expose it publicly. Um, that is doxing. Um, and then in terms of Pridefall, I, to be honest, didn't know about it until Blunt hit me up yesterday and was like, Pridefall is happening, we should do something. So Daily, maybe you can speak more on that. 
Sure, yeah, um, I definitely agree with your uh, definition of doxing. Um, I also think of it as just like any like revelation of unwanted personal identifying information. Um, and that can mean a lot of different things for people. Uh, and then Pridefall is this sort of clumsy, idiotic campaign coming out of 4chan to troll, uh, harass, and to potentially dox uh, LGBTQ activists and uh, just individuals online. So it looks like it's going to be targeting mostly Twitter and Instagram, maybe some other social media platforms. Um, it also, I just want to add there, it also reminds me a lot of uh, the thought audit, which was largely yeah. a fear-based campaign. So like, I, I think it's important that I don't want to spread like misinformation, but like this is a potential threat. And I think it always makes sense to take whatever security steps make the most sense for you. Yeah, yeah. I've, I've done a little bit of digging into like the campaign itself and sort of like the core people talking about it. And like, just from my experience, I don't believe that they're that sophisticated of actors doing this. So I don't have the greatest faith in their like technological capacity to get anything done other than trolling. However, it can still be scary and it's always like prepare for the worst, right? But I, I do think it's worth saying that they're, they're probably fools and they're probably not gonna do anything more than just like being dicks online. Which is great for us, so we can be prepared and we don't have to worry about doing anything over the top or sophisticated in terms of protecting our data. It's just baseline stuff that you could do every day to stay safe on the web. So yeah, thank you for that explanation daily. That's really helpful. All right, so if that's all we have to say on doxing and pride fall, um, daily, feel free to segue into your spiel. Okay, cool. Um, yeah, apologies for not having a more specific <laughs> uh, sort of agenda for what my outline is. It's sort of like a generalized spiel taken from the previous doxing self-defense workshops I've given with Hacking Hustling and elsewhere. Um, but let me go ahead and get started with that. Uh, I'll screen share my notes. <clears throat> okay, can you all see that okay? Cool. Great. Yep. Uh, so as I mentioned, I'm a staff technologist at the Electronic Frontier Foundation, also with Hacking Hustling. Feel free to take my contact info there, that email address. Um, I can take follow-up questions there. I should say that I'm not uh, here on like official EFF capacity. I'm here of my own volition, so I'm not giving any sort of legal counsel or advice. However, if you do have legal questions, specifically if you're being targeted or any sort of like cyber attack, um, feel free to direct them my way and I can put you in touch with the right people. So, uh, as we mentioned, doxing is like the unwanted revelation of personal identifying information and it can be used to like aim harassment or targeted violence. Um, you can prevent against this with sort of like basic, what I call data hygiene. Uh, data hygiene is just like any other sort of hygienic practice. You care for yourself and that in itself will be a way of caring for others. Um, so like in the, in, in the occasion of an incident, you want to notify the people that you're close with because they could be um, implicated in those sorts of events. And this is a continual practice. Um, Doxing like rarely takes place on a single platform. Or Haley, can you give me one second to figure out how to pin your screen? It seems like folks are asking for that. I'm not totally sure how to do that. If anyone in the chat has any advice. Yeah, no problem. I mean, I can always come back to my screen because honestly, it's not a very visual rich uh, presentation I'm giving. <laughs> are folks in the audience seeing the text-based stuff or Daily's Hacking Hustling screen? Oh, right. Okay, that's all you, that's all you need to see. If you're seeing the text-based stuff, that's great. Great, thanks, because Daily's camera's not. Cool. Go ahead. Um, so, where was, oh, so as I was saying, doxing, it like rarely takes place in one platform. Like, it's not gonna happen, doxing isn't gonna happen because you use Twitter and your IP address is somehow like tied to your Twitter account, right? It's usually from taken like, 
lots of different little pieces of information found on different open source platforms. Open source just meaning like readily available information you can get online. Um, so with that said, one way that you can eliminate that, there is this uh, list here of different links I've compiled. These are different, I definitely recommend you screenshot this and visit each of these. Um, I can also like email them out after to the attendees. Um, I believe these are all still active right now, but these are all like opt out links where you have to consent. You have to like withdraw your consent out of your personal information from being shared here. And these are often sort of like the central nodes for where the information gets shared elsewhere. And it can be like your phone number to like different mailing addresses you've used, even different names you've used in the past, et cetera. Um, it sucks that you have to like, it's not an opt-in model, it's an opt-out model. Uh, but that said, you should definitely opt out. <laughs> so take a screenshot of those links, visit each of them, and make sure that you're opting out of your information being shared there. That will like cover a lot of your bases for like doxing prevention. Uh, I'm gonna scroll past this now to the next one. Um, so now just some like general advice on social media. Uh, you'll always want to opt for higher privacy and security settings. I believe Milka is going to go into that more. Um, but like generally speaking, those option pages will use the same language and icons to display that information and like give you those options. So as you go through each of your accounts, you'll get used to recognizing the different terms and language they use to sort of say the same things. Uh, always opt for higher settings um, and like don't feel bad if they're confusing if the, set the settings are confusing if like they display what we call dark patterns which is like when they intentionally mislead you to actually give more information um, it's always in these platforms as best interest to get as much data from you as possible because that's where their profits are coming from uh, however they are legally responsible to make sure you have the option to uh, withdraw your consent from that sort of data information sharing. Uh, also, turn off all of your location services for all of your different accounts. Um, avoid cross-contamination between these different apps. You can do that with like separating the different registry email addresses you use to access them. Uh, compartmentalize how you're accessing them. That could be using different browsers, different browser sessions. Um, if you're using a VPN, you can switch your VPN location in between different ones. Scrubbing the, if you're sharing media between different um, accounts, uh, scrubbing the metadata that these, like the images you share, um, uh, and more than images, like other documents you might share. Um, some of that might sound pretty technical. Uh, I'm kind of doing like a generalized sort of firehouse of information right now. So again, please feel free to reach out to me if you have questions about like, what is a VPN or, what is EXIF metadata? <laughs> um, okay, another uh, step to take is just always enable multi-factor authentication on your apps. Um, that is when you use like multiple steps to log into your account. You've probably seen that like when a, like your bank will text you like a one-time code to log into your account or something. Um, I would avoid using those one-time like text messages or SMS codes because if you are suffering from a pretty intelligent targeted attack, um, it's not that difficult to intercept or sniff those like that communication, and they, your um, like one-time code could be sort of snatched up before you get to it. If that makes sense, um, there are usually other ways of going about multi-factor authentication. Um, Google Authenticator, even though it comes out of like the you know big G Google wheelhouse, it's actually a very good. Um, authentication app. Okay, now I'm just going to go into uh, sort of basic, like what to do if you have been doxxed. Um, these are some steps in order. Uh, I, in fact, let me, hmm. I'm going to go ahead and paste these into the text screen that you're looking at. Um, these are my personal notes, so sorry if it's like not the, um, best looking, but <laughs> I can send out a more formal list of this later. Uh, but if you have been doxxed, the first thing you should do is go through each of your accounts and lock them all, turn them private, deactivate them. 
it's your discretion which to do first and in which priority, but you want to make sure you're looking at every one of your accounts um, because any one of those can be implicated if you're being doxxed from one, like from one place. It's not that difficult to implicate your other accounts or presences online. Then I would get to trust, like notifying your trusted network. Uh, they can also be implicated. Um, and people in your trusted network can help you in like monitoring your different affected accounts. They can help you with contacting the support services on your accounts. Um, they like you'll they'll help you with reviewing your own threat model and practices, and of course, developing shared strategies and community responses and community like response plans. Uh, also, create an incident log. This is super important, not just for legal purposes, but for like your own analysis of what to do better next time. Um, an incident log can be just as basic as featuring the different dates, times, description of the event, and the result, or like the, like the byproduct result of each incident that happens. You want that, like, like I said, both for like legal um, uh, purposes later, if you do, if you are implicated in any sort of like, like uh, you know, um, litigative case after the attacks, or if you choose to go down that route yourself. Um, you want to like have pretty thorough information about that, but also like if you have that information, it helps you beef up your plan next time. Like it'll give you information about like, oh wow, it seems like these are all taking place at a certain time or, or um, it's a certain type of attack that maybe means that um, the particular social media account I'm using, um, the platform itself has bad security posture and it's not my own fault. Um, yeah, it will inform how you like restructure your own threat model. And also, chances are, if you're being targeted with something like this Pridefall campaign, there are others who are being targeted as well. And if you can compare that list with others, then it can help you narrow down who, the, who people are that are attacking, where they're coming from, um, and again, like how to protect yourselves against it. Um, then, after you've done those, after you've created your incident log, you've contacted your network, and you've locked down your accounts, you're gonna to want to start taking a fine tooth comb through all of your accounts. First, changing all of the passwords for each, making sure each password is unique, random, and long, just to make sure that you maintain to be like you maintain access to each of your accounts and you're the only one that has access to them. You want that first. Then you can go through and review the privacy and security settings, raise the bar. Milka will show you that, of course. Um, and then notify their support staff. Um, and I mean the support staff for the accounts that you use. Uh, they all have dedicated teams for this sort of incident response, um, specifically for doxing and targeted harassment. Um, it, they'll, you want to be mindful that like they're, you're going, they're going to ask that you share some information you may be uncomfortable with sharing with them if you do choose to go down that route. So you have to like take that into account before you start doing it. But know that like their legal teams and their tech teams that are responsible for dealing with the sort of incident response are probably a lot more robust than you are yourself. So there's some trade-offs there. Okay, and then if the attacks that you're suffering from are really overwhelming and massively orchestrated, potentially dangerous, we're talking like um, if you're being like swatted, if you have people like calling the police on your house or something, um, that's very severe, right? That's a very severe attack that you're suffering from, potentially very dangerous. Um, there are professional services and firms you can, um, you can pay to help you mitigate a response. Um, they can be quite expensive and I think they vary in efficacy and I haven't done these personally, but I've reviewed them enough to like know that they are offering something that's helpful. Um, do your research basically looking into these but that is these accounts here for these websites these are all different places that offer that sort of service um all from like they offer services from scrubbing your information from being publicly available online sort of like reverse seo um to like all the way down to like uh sort of digital bodyguarding type services of course, that's like a much more expensive um, route to go down. Uh, okay, 
Now, the last thing I wanted to cover <laughs> before I'm finished, sorry for talking so quickly. Um, there is like this exercise I've been thinking of that I'm going to be writing for shortly for the EFF. Um, that is just like a way to begin to visualize your individual data footprint. And this is an exercise I think that everyone should do no matter what, but it will definitely help to like inform how you can best prevent doxing from taking place or most like targeted cyber attacks. I'm putting that in the document here. Um, so it's mapping out your data footprint. Uh, it's a very like drawing based exercise. Um, so like the first thing you do is begin by drawing out each of the devices. That's literally your computers, your cell phones, um, tablets, whatever you use to get online it could be like ones that you own or other ones that you have to use for other purposes like maybe you have a work laptop or you go to the like the library to use a computer because you don't actually own your own maybe you have a family um, computer you use you want to draw out each of those then you can begin to draw out different groups of people you speak with I usually try and do this with like a little like triangle or like a different sort of shape that signifies it's a person or a group of people you're speaking with. Um, from like a sex working perspective, I think of it like an easy way to differentiate between different groups is like your like vanilla or day life versus like the clients you speak with or other, um, other workers in your network. Um, maybe from an activist point of view, you have like more of like the activist you're dealing with um, friends. Then you can draw the different online accounts that you access. And I usually draw that, like signify that with a cloud shape. Um, so you have these three groups, right? You have like, you have uh, the devices you use, you have the people you speak with, and then you have the different online accounts you access, um, being like your email, social media, Netflix, message boards, et cetera. And then the point of this whole exercise is to draw the connections between each of those things. So I usually start with, um, drawing the connections between the device you use to the different online accounts that you access. For most of us, this might look like pretty much everything you access online is between all of your different devices. That will highlight, you know, a weak point in your particular uh, uh, security posture. Then from there, you can draw the connections between the different online accounts you, like, you use to contact the different groups of people in your networks. You can also do the same thing between your specific device to the different people. So if you're using like SMS or iMessage um, or phone calls to contact specific people, you want to draw that line between those. Then you want to look at all of the, the different connections you've drawn between those different groups and highlight which of those lines are unnecessary, like which connections are unnecessary, which can you pare down to compartmentalize a bit better. Um, and this is really just a practice in like setting clear intentions over your devices and your accounts for the right purposes. Um, yeah, uh, look forward to like a more sort of thorough guide on this later. Um, and I'm gonna be going through like how to, like which technologies and tools to implement depending on how like the shape of your map or like how the different patterns of connections you might have that are most common with people. Um, that'll be coming up later. Uh, then, okay, sorry. One last little section I wanted to cover was, there's a, obviously a lot of us are going out to protests um, over the last couple of days. We'll continue to be going to protests. Any sort of like physical action you might be doing, I wanted to cover just a few basic tips with that. Um, you've seen a lot of these all, like online already, passing around, most of them are true. Um, you can pretty much guarantee, be guaranteed that any protest you're going to, there will be facial recognition cameras taking place and there will be um, uh, cell network simulators, um, uh, stingrays present. So you want to prevent against that first. Uh, cover your face, cover your hair, cover tattoos. And, like, Haley, can you explain what the stingray cell thing is? Yeah, absolutely. Um, uh, a stingray is a cell site simulator, which means that it is a fake cell tower used by police and other private um, companies to hit with your phone. It poses as a cell as a cell tower, so that your phone sends its like will try to connect to it and give it information about like 
the device that you're using, the account name of, or sort of like the owner name of the device, um, where it's coming from, um, and then different other like bits of identifying metadata attached to your phone. Um, this is often used by police forces to target activists. Um, and in like New York especially, it's just used everywhere. <laughs> a, lot of, a lot of police forces like, like own these devices, they lease them out privately, uh, or they lease them from private companies. Um, so guaranteed those are out there at these protests. Um, they're only active when your phone is on. However, if it is off, there's your phone can still be tracked by more intelligent or sophisticated um, tracking mechanisms. So if you don't, if you don't need to bring your phone, do not bring it to these protests, especially if you're doing black ops activist work. Um, you want to also like cover your face, cover your tattoos, tattoo as face recognition. Obviously, like you've heard the idea of writing people's phone numbers on your body for if you do get arrested or taken anywhere. Make sure that that is only on unexposed skin. You don't want that to be present in any photos that you're using or that get posted anywhere. Um, and then just be mindful of your particular position in larger crowds. Always try and keep that sort of like meta view of yourself in larger crowds just for when things get really hairy especially if you're doing, like, like I said, more black ops activist work. Um, okay, I think I covered most of what I wanted to. Um, I, I, I wanted to go a bit more into like community uh, response. Um, I guess one thing I'll shout out is like always use encrypted messaging. Signal obviously is best for one-on-one -on -one communication. There's also a great piece of software called Keybase, which is even better for a group chat and for file sharing. Uh, and it's really easy to use. Um, check both those out. Here are some resources I'm putting up here. Um, this guide was one that we came up with from the first hacking hustling that took place at iBeam. Here are some links from EFF. Uh, the Security Education Companion has like some threat modeling exercises and some just like general tools to use. Surveillance Self-Defense, uh, similar, but it has some more like activist focused um, guides. And then this is just a tool that I've seen pop up over the last 24 hours, which is really great because it's a free metadata scrubbing tool for images that you use, um, which just, uh, it's great. It like, it helps you like, it, it blurs images so you can blur people's faces out of any images you want to share about protesting. And it also scrubs the like identifying metadata from those images. Awesome. <sighs> Thank okay. you, Daly. I'm, cool. I'm going to ask a couple of questions before we move on to the second part. And then if I don't get to your question right now, it's just because I think it's better suited for the um, for after the second half. Um, so first, there's a question about thoughts on using Zoom and alternatives like Wire or Jitsi, convenience for, for security. I think that's exactly the answer. It's weighing convenience for security. Zoom is a really stable platform that allows us to have five people in the webinar. Um, Daily, I don't know if you want to add anything on that. We sort of talked, we started our last training talking about why we were using Zoom because like it doesn't have yeah. the best practices. If yeah. you just want to add a sentence to that. Totally. I mean, so they, yeah, they pretty much covered it in the question. There is, you will, you, you will always be weighing conve convenience and ease of use over the security of something. Unfortunately, the most secure methods of doing anything online are often the most technologically complicated. Um, and then often I think that like the best things you can do are, or sometimes some of, some of the best practices you can do are the least technologically complicated, if that makes sense. Like, um, not simply shutting up, right? Like not saying like what you're doing or abstracting it in some way. This is called steganography, like hiding messages in plain sight, using code words, using like coded language as sex workers, we're all really good at this already. We're better than most people. Same thing with being queer activists. Like we're better than most people at like hiding our meaning with like known language or sort of like in speak, right? Um, so you can still use like, I still use Google. You can use Facebook, Instagram, Zoom, these sort of like larger, often predatory platforms that are like gleaning our data 
it is totally worth using them because they're easy to use. Just be mindful of how you're using them and what you're sharing with them. And right, like all of all of the hacking hustling webinars that we've done so far are recorded and available to the public afterwards. So we try and remind folks that like if you don't feel comfortable using this platform, this will be available for you outside. And if we were having a conversation with like if we were <laughs> planning something that we were more concerned about the security of rather than just sharing basic harm reduction tips that are available online, maybe this isn't the platform that we would choose. But I think it's a good question. Yeah, um, if we're saying anything illegal right now, I wouldn't be doing it on Zoom, right? <laughs> I'm, not, I'm um, giving you advice on how to like protect yourself. Um, right. I will also say that it is, if you are doing more like, um, uh, like black ops or like really intense sort of activism work, um, there is a very useful tactic in giving yourself a sort of vanilla profile um, or like having like a very friendly looking Facebook account or things like that. Like you are more suspicious if you aren't present online. There's this like idea in like data security called chaff, which is when you like fill data pools with meaningless information and it like pollutes the entire data pool. Um, Okay. I'll leave it at that. <laughs> okay. I'm going to ask um, a few questions just so we can make sure that we get to them. Um, Daily or Milka, if you want to just shout out like one, sent one sentence answers, that would be amazing. Mm -hmm. um, what's the difference in Signal? Oh, I'm going to. What's the difference in Signal than, say, iMessage? My understanding is that iMessage was also encrypted. No. Um, well, yes, in a way it is. And like in that, I bet iMessage, they're like the servers in which iMessages are like. Their specific servers probably have great security, but it's not end-to-end -end encrypted. Signal's end-to-end -end encrypted, which means that it is encrypted every step of the way in transit to the endpoints. And I know that sounds weird, but what it means is that even if you intercept that request or like the communication that's happening, it will mean nothing to you. Like you can't, like, God, the, the message yeah. itself is encrypted, right? Whereas yep. with like iMessage or SMS, you can intercept them and often get plain text versions of what's being sent. Thank you. Um, okay, great. Okay, so Milha, I think we're ready to go on to you and all the questions that um, I haven't gotten to yet, we will do after this next section. Okay, cool. Can you uh, do me a favor and make me host for a sec just so I can turn on my video again? Yeah, no, second, Thanks. one sec. Also, great questions, everybody. Thanks for asking them. Okay, I just did that. Yeah, thank you so much for these questions. These are great. And um, we'll, we'll do our best to get to a lot of the other ones after this next session. Do you have everything you need, Milha? I am ready. Okay, right. great. I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen. All right, so we're gonna go over Twitter first, which is actually my favorite platform. I'm not really, I don't do much on IG, but okay, just, just to um, like context, please don't do anything I'm doing. I'm like the worst example, and I'm saying this because I am a performer that used their first and middle legal name um, as a performer, so basically don't do anything I'm doing. Um, that being said, I'm gonna go over some quick things that you can do on Twitter to protect your data. So I'm gonna pull up my stickies. And right, if folks, if, fo if this is things that people are interested in doing, like the what will work for everyone won't be the same, but if you wanna go ahead and take out your devices, if you have them and um, sort of follow a along with what Milha is doing, um, and if you want to explain why you're doing them at the time and like what they do, that would be great. So you can think of this as like sort of like a lock down your shit together time. Awesome. Yes. And I wish that I could do some mirroring on my phone because I, I know t this is like more relevant when you're on your device, but we'll, we'll make do. So um, if you're on your web app, if you're on your desktop, you can head over to this more button right here. It's usually underneath your profile click on this, and then you'll see a settings and privacy link. 
go ahead and click on that. I'm gonna give y'all a moment to find this in case you're not quite there yet. So I'm gonna give this like 10 seconds and then I'll move forward. this one waiting. All right, so while y'all are doing that, um, we're gonna take a few steps. First, we're gonna make our account private. Um, and we can do this in several ways. First thing we can do, um, <laughs> which is uh, something that I won't do, but I will like, I guess, replicate it. Um, you can change your username like I said, I'm using my first and middle legal name. Um, so I would just like, I don't know, change it to like something that doesn't, like it's not associated with my name at all. Um, that would be like a good choice or something even more obscure because this is a pretty queer um, username. But that's like one step that you can take. Um, you can also use an obscure profile image, you can see here that this is my real face. Um, you can use something not associated with your life at all, and that would also really help in protecting your identity. All right, and so you can also protect your tweets or make your pass or your account private. So let's go ahead and do that. So we're in our settings, we go down to the privacy and safety tab, and I'm just gonna move this, it's in my way, one second. And then make sure to check on this box, it will prompt you with this um, modal, and you can say protect. Now if I navigate to my profile, of course I can see it, but if I were to go on a like, private browser and look up my account, you would be met with this. These tweets are protected. So nobody's able to see any of my tweets at all, which is great if you're going out into- Unless they're already following you. Yes, exactly. Unless they're already following you. Thanks for that. Um, yeah, especially if you're going out into the world and protesting, that's one great measure you can take. All right, and then let's go ahead, after we've protected our account, we can turn off location tracking. So give me a moment to find that actually. Um, privacy and safety, location information. So privacy and safety, location information. Add location information. I have this currently checked off because I do not want this associated with my tweets. So that looks good. All right, and please at any point, like I, I'm not looking at my Zoom um, chat right now, but Blunt, if anybody asks me to slow down, please let yeah, me know. Yeah, I got the chat and I was, you're fine. I was just gonna also say like, we're trying to get this information to you quickly, but we're sharing the recording. So if you miss anything, like in an hour or two, the link will be live and we'll share it on the Instagram and Twitter. So you can slow it down and watch it at whatever speed works best for you. Awesome, perfect, thank you. All right, so now that we've turned off our location, that's looking good. We can also turn off photo tagging. Um, so nobody can tag you in photos that would prevent like the, the need to have that discourse with your community like, hey, please don't tag me or attach my profile to anything unless I've given you direct consent. That's a lot of conversations to be having, especially when you're a part of a bigger community. So just disabling that functionality period would be really helpful in this instance. Um, turn off discoverability via email and number. So what that means is generally people can find you if they have your email or your phone number. That would be no bueno. So we want to turn that off. Again, this is in the privacy and safety. And then you navigate down to the discoverability and contacts. And just make sure that these two checkboxes are unchecked. All right. Okay. And now that we've taken the measures to make our account private,
private, we're also going to block abusers um, or bad actors. So let's see, who who am I going to fake block right now? Obviously, I don't want to do that. There was a link to the to the Pride Fall ones. I don't know if I sent that oh. to you, but yeah, that would be a good one too. Um, to do, I'm I'm not going to do that right now because I yeah. have no idea yeah. where it is, but. Yes, uh, I don't want to block this person because obviously they're against white supremacy, but if I were to, I would click on this drop down arrow here next to their tweet and I would block Tadiana. Not going to do that, like I said, but you can also go directly to their profile, click on this, um, these three dots right here, and then go to the block link. All right, and then we're going to also make sure that we have a stronger password. Daily mentioned this earlier. A stronger password is generally a password that has at least 16 characters. Um, all right, I, I use this secure password generator if I'm not logged into like LastPass or 1Password. Um, it depends on like what platform you're using. Sometimes they have limitations, but I like to include like symbols if they allow that for my password. And yeah, just make sure it's 16 at least. That's a strong password. And then you go down to this button, generate new password. And then what I do is I go on to like either LastPass, LastPass, can I spell today? LastPass or like, so this one is free, that's why I recommend it to people. Um, but then there's also 1Password, which is um, a paid platform, but it's also really good for storing all of these complex 16 character um, passwords that you're gonna need to track somehow. Um, both have extensions for Chrome if that's what you use. So this is my top two recommendations for storing these strong random passwords. All right, and then the way that you would change your password in Twitter, going back to the settings and privacy. Oh, and yes, then password. You gotta type in your current password and then your randomly generated password twice to confirm. And then so after you have a strong password, the next step that you can do, and Daily mentioned this earlier as well, is to enable two-factor uh, two auth, um, as opposed to like sending an SMS, which uh, Daily did not recommend. Um, and the way that you can turn on two-factor auth, if I can remember, let's see. My apologies, give me a second should be in here. So protect your tweets, safety, uh, personalized data. I had this a second ago. Do y'all remember how to turn on two, two factor auth in here? I'm like, I'm not sure. I'm sure you could right now. Google it real quick too. Yeah, yeah, true. Two factor auth. All right, cool. Yep. And then I'll also include this in the docs um, or in the coded doc that we sent out. And what's cool about these docs too is like you have Apple, Android, and like desktop uh, documentation for this. So I'm just going to go ahead to and put this in here um, to Twitter off for Twitter. All right, cool. So yeah, we go to, down to account settings, tap to factor authentication. All right, so security. I'm saying account login and security is security. Oh, okay, cool. Right. Yeah, I think it's um, if you go under account. To oh, account, side. yeah. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Awesome, appreciate that, awesome. Okay, here it is. So we're gonna go to two-factor auth. Um, as Daly said, we don't recommend the text message. We can use an authentication app. That would also be cool. Um, and then it'll walk you through exactly how to turn this on. You gotta enter your password, oh, which I don't remember right now. 
Um, so I won't go through this because I don't want to have y'all sit here and try to figure out my password, but just go through the prompt. Um, it'll be very intuitive and that will enable your two-factor auth. Generally, you have to like download like on a, an authenticator app, probably like Authy. Um, I know Google has an authentication app too, but that will be the app that you will need in order to enable to FA. And what that looks like is essentially you will log in, you'll get a notification on your phone. And if that is indeed you, like you're logging in from the location where you're logging from, then you can hit, yeah, hey, that's me. And then it, you'll be directed to your actual profile on Twitter once you can confirm that you are indeed you. And let's see, additional password protection. So I know that they have password reset protection. When you check this box, you will be required to verify additional information before you can request a password reset with just your username. So this obviously will be very helpful if there are bad actors and they're trying to hack into your shit. Confirm connected apps, sessions, and devices. So let's go ahead and look at what this means. I'm gonna move this. All right, apps and sessions. So this is within privacy and safety. You go down to, actually, no, I'm sorry. It's gonna be in account, then apps and sessions underneath the data and permissions section right here. And from here, you can see where you currently have um, sessions. And this is confusing to me, actually, because I am not in Oakland. So that's something that, that you should look out for. Like, always make sure um, that you don't have any sessions where you're not located, of course. All right. And I think there was something else that I wanted to mention. I, I know that with Twitter, um, you can enable, like, other apps to use your your account for login so that is something that i'm going to include in the docs too i don't 100 percent have it off the top of my head so make sure to look out for the resources i'll organize this better and give you the docs so that you can check into like which apps you're currently using to log in via twitter and i think that's it for twitter do you have anything to add, Blunt? Yeah, I just was thinking too, this is something, so I just deleted all of my content from, from Instagram and was thinking of doing it for Twitter, mostly just to put shit behind the paywall. But also I think like if you have a lot of content there and you still want what you're sharing to be able to be shared widely, I think like just downloading a backup and wiping is also an option so that there's less information there. Um, it's just another way to go about it. Like if you have a lot of followers and you want to be able to like share information quickly, as quickly as possible, um, downloading backups, it's harder to do on Twitter. It's easier to do on Instagram, but I can share resources on that too. Someone's Perfect. also saying, Thank you so much. yeah, you can change the name of your devices because they might show as double based on last used history. I'm, awesome. I'm not totally sure I get that. Do you understand that? Um, if whoever um, posted that comment, if they could provide resources, that would be great. Yeah, if you provide resources, we'll drop that in the link. And I also, just thinking of it, um, if your airdrop isn't turned off, turn it off in public spaces and make sure that the name on your device is also an alias, I would highly recommend. Okay, and now we're going to move on to Instagram. Yep, Instagram. Um, all right. So this is my Instagram on my web app. It, it's not the same as, again, like if you're on your device. So I, I wish that I could mirror it right now, um, but we are not there. I, I guess I could have logged in through my, um, my phone, but I didn't do that. So that's okay. We're gonna go to our settings here. And let's go over changing password first. So that's the first thing you'll see. Of course, you need your old password first and then confirming your new password second. Again, you can use the um, 
secure, or I just like Google random password generator. It's passwordsgenerator.net. And you can use this baby to make a new password for Instagram. And all right, so another thing you can do is you can choose whether your photos and videos you've been tagged in appear on your Instagram profile. I've included this into the docs here, I believe. And I'll double check to make sure, but this is another measure you can take. All right, and then again, similar to Twitter, you're gonna remove your legal name. Don't, don't be Milka Hui, don't be me. <laughs> and use like an obscure name. Um, also use an obscure profile picture. Protect your account by enabling users to request to, be, to follow you versus just being able to follow you without that request. Um, and the way that you can do that is by making this account private. So I'm just gonna click on that. Um, you wanna make sure that your activity status is unchecked. Cause yeah, the, the least people can track about you, the better. Um, I have this on, but if you prefer, if you like have any reason to disallow sharing, then I highly recommend that you do that. Let's also look into the comment settings here. Um, hide comments that contain any of the words or phrases you type above. So this is great for like preventative measure. If there's like any kind of words that you don't absolutely want in your comments that could trigger you or your community members, this is a good place to put in all these keywords. All right, and then photos of you. Choose how you want photos to be added to your profile. I'm actually not, I was looking at this earlier and I'm not sure what this means. Do you daily or blunt know what the significance of this feature is? Is it that it has to go through you first and you, I, I remember something like that from Facebook and Instagram is Facebook. So I'm assuming it's that like, yeah. you would show up privately to you first and you'd say, okay, but that's just my best guess. I see. Okay. Yeah, I, I didn't have, since this was kind of like impromptu, like I didn't have the time really to like research this, but definitely like this is something that I will want to investigate and then hopefully add this back to the doc. So y'all have the, this for future reference. We're also gonna want to view account data. Um, this is similar to Twitter where you just wanna check for whether there's any suspicious activity on your account that you can't, associate with any activity that you've done recently. Um, and yeah, this is, this is all like, I mean, I'm fine with this all being <laughs> recorded because my shit's just out there. But um, yeah, you can use that to like review all the information, all your data. Enable two-factor off. Do not click on this text message checkbox. But yes, um, you do want to use two off here, two FA. I always forget the F and the two FA. But um, is not supported by the web app. Okay, so this is significant. This is good to note. You can't do this on your web app, but you can definitely do this via your phone. Um, so this is an activity that we would have to do on our devices. All right. Turn off location tracking and turn off photo tagging. I think we didn't go over the location tracking yet, right? Um, so let me go into here. Location tracking. Okay, here it is. So this is for iPhone. I will look for Android support too. Um, I don't, don't know if I can do this via the app. Um, oh yeah, I can't do this via the app. I checked. I didn't see this anywhere. And somebody could correct me if I'm wrong, but you have to go to your settings, tap privacy and location services, and select never, never share your location services or your location tracking. Um, and then let's go over blocking abusers or bad actors. So let's go to my Instagram. I wonder if I can do this on the web app as well. I probably can. Uh, so let's see here. So you can go over here and I don't want to obviously do this, but 
you can block anybody who is not cool, block this user, restrict report user. Um, Blood, do you know if you report user, I know if you report user, you have the ability to just block them through that process. Yes, so yep, you can report the user so that Instagram will get a notification of, of that, um, or you can just block them without notifying them. So like something that I've done on my, on my sex worker handles is I've blocked family members that I don't want to uh, suggest my professional persona to them because that is a public profile. Um, and then on my, my private Instagrams, I use like a pseudonym. Sometimes it's on private and I have my avatar that's not a picture of my face. So if by chance it says like, I feel like so many sex workers are outed through the suggest a friend. Like if you're in like the same location as a client, it might then suggest you as a friend to them on your personal account. And if you have a face photo, they might find out information about you that you don't want them to have. And if you don't have a face photo, but you have a real name, or if your airdrop is on, I've heard of sex workers being outed to clients because their airdrop was on and like their legal name was on their phone or like plugging in a phone to like um, a car radio and then their name coming up. So like all of my devices have fake names on them uh, just to just as like a form of harm reduction. Awesome. Thanks for that, Blunt. So I guess I went through that quicker than I thought, which is totally fine because now we can open up for Q&A. Yeah. I'm going to start asking some questions. And remember, everyone, like that was a lot of information really fast. Um, you're going to make the choices that work best for you. Some people might want to go private for June based on like what their threat model is or how if they think that that would make themselves safer. Um, and just make the choices that work best for you. Um, so I'm going to go into some of the questions right now. And if folks have questions, please drop them uh, into the Q&A so that we make sure that we get to them. Okay. Someone is saying, someone mentioned an encrypted communication alternative besides Signal. What was that? Daily, that might be a question for you. Uh, yeah, I think Milka just said it as well, but Keybase. Um, they're both easy. I think Keybase is a lot more feature rich right now, so it can be a little more like, it's it, although it's easy to use, there is like more to get on. Someone else is saying, yes, there's also like a, um, what is it, Telegram thing? Wire. Transport, I don't know. Uh, really, the, the, the most widely vetted and sort of like industry standard for this sort of thing is Signal, just because it is an open source one. So meaning like the code itself is audited by the community. Um, so we can see like exactly what's taking place. Uh, it's also the same protocol that's put into WhatsApp. So WhatsApp is also like end-to-end um, -end encrypted, but keep in mind that they're owned by Facebook, so. Someone is asking a question. When asked for permission to access media, does that mean Facebook gets to store our photos somewhere and hand them over to DHS or ICE if asked? Yes. Great. <laughs> uh, so there's a, yeah, uh, there's a big over, mm, the problem with Facebook is that like, there is as much they will tell you about like the, the rights you have on their platforms and like what they will or will not share with others and then what they're doing behind your back. Um, Facebook is one of the most insidious kind of versions of that. And there's a lot of talk in like sort of deeper communities about like representatives from three letter agencies as official board members at Facebook. I don't want to be too tinfoil hat about it, but like don't, don't trust Facebook with anything you don't want them to have. Um, I, 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 th I do think though that Facebook is a great tool for creating a sort of chaff or vanilla lifestyle that you want to portray to, you know, be a good citizen in the eyes of uh, the law. <laughs> um, and someone's saying we're talking about an activism profile, right? Not our sex work profile. And I would, I, I have done a great job of mixing mine, which I have mixed feelings about. Um, but I think that this shit can apply to, to either like similar security practices you might want to. To make for yourself and it really just depends on what what you're working with and what your concern what your personal concerns are Agreed. Um, any sort of like delinquent activity you're doing can be like covered with these sorts of practices yeah and so much of our organizing is it's being crossed over like especially now especially like post-fasta-sesta um it's it's 
becoming harder and harder to have those be separate identities. Um, uh, please ask the questions in the Q&A so I can make sure that I can get to them. And also, I was hoping that someone had seen the tweet about Pridefall with the users to block. I think I sent it to Daily and Milha, but I can't find it because I'm recording. So if someone wants to send that to me, we can like go through and block them together um, while we go through and ask questions. Okay, someone says- also is, to, <laughs> It's also safe to assume that those users might be um, stale now, those accounts, and yep. that there are new ones popping up. The, yeah. These sorts of campaigns are usually with like many different accounts that yeah. burn out after an hour or two. Yeah, and I was, when I went through and blocked them all, they were all made like a week ago. Um, someone's asking, is having your social profiles open overall just a bad idea? Is it possible to keep social profiles open and will it and still be safe or is private accounts really the only way to go? Uh, I definitely think it's safe to have open profiles. I think it's okay. You just, it's the, the, the point is to be mindful of the stuff that you're sharing on there and to it's, yeah, be mindful of it and to try and take a bit of ownership about what kind of data is being passed between you to the device, to the account, and to the people that you're interacting with on the accounts. Yeah. yeah well, oh, go ahead. Oh, I was just saying, we were talking about when going to protests, like making sure to cover your face if you're able. And like, I know that like iPhones can now recognize your face with a face mask. So like glasses, a hat, a face mask, um, we were joking around, but actually maybe not a bad idea, but fake tattoos, just like making sure to cover up any identifying features or scars and maybe adding something as like, a, as a decoy, I guess. Um, what were you saying, Noha? Yeah, I just wanted to piggyback off of what Daily was saying, because I generally don't make my accounts protected. As you know, I use my like legal first and middle name and I've never felt unsafe. But that being said, I'm also very mindful about what type of content that I put out um, because I'm like such a public facing person and my persona, like Milka Halili is very like much my persona. I am very mindful to separate my actual private life with like what I'm outputting persona wise. Um, so it just goes back to being mindful and really like safety is a personal experience and only you can determine what will make you feel safe and you know your situation better than anybody else. So yes, definitely yes. like use your own gut, your intuition, your experiences to inform how you safely navigate your public experience on the web. Yeah, and I also think, I don't know if we mentioned this in the beginning, but in uh, our other harm reduction digital security training, we talk about digital security practices being similar to like safe sex. So like if I'm doing something and my partner's doing something, then our community is safer. Um, so while that doesn't mean that everyone has to go on private, that's not necessarily the, that what works best for everyone, but like knowing these things and like what images to share that um, blocking out protesters faces, taking screenshots of that so that the apps can't remove them, things like that help not only yourself, but also community. Um, someone was also saying, uh, turn off contact thinking on social media. I think that is a great idea that like so often it's come so close to happening for me where it's like, do you want to add every contact to your friend list? Um, so definitely turn that off. Um, someone else is asking for a definition of contact tracing. Daily, can you take that one? Yeah, sure. Sorry. <laughs> I was typing in the group chat. Um, uh, contact tracing, that's a question? Is that what you said? Okay. Uh, yes. Yeah, contact tracing is, it's like a new, it's a, it's a new form of like information tracking that is taking place in response to COVID. Correct me if I'm wrong. Um, that is like, find, it's, the idea is like, tracing who has been infected, who they come in contact with, and then like tracing the sort of like the nodes of connections between that person and others based on the like, uh, and then kind of like weighing the likelihood in which they came in close contact or they were infected um, and like prioritizing this, that sort of like network 
mapping, <laughs> if that makes sense. And so there's a lot of like really shoddy apps that are being made in development right now to uh, try and do this. Um, and obviously there are a lot of uh, privacy concerns. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, thank you. Mm -hmm. Someone is asking, is it safe to have sex work and private social media accounts on the same phone? Not everyone can afford more than one phone. Not everyone can afford a phone. Lots of people share phones to do their sex work on. It's a choice uh, that, that you need to make for yourself about what the risks are. And I'm going to point you to the direction of our, our other training where we go into that, uh, where Daily talks about that in a lot more detail. Um, so we just answered this question. I, I think it can be. It can yeah. be safe. Mm -hmm. And right, there is, like, there is no such thing as safety. To me, this is all just, like, harm reduction and how we can keep each other safe. Yeah, and there's, like, I mean, there's a lot to be said, like I mentioned before, for, like, that stupid word, steganography. Like, if, like, if you can be doing illegal activities, but if you're talking about it in a way that is um, not immediately illegal to talk about, then, like, you have a lot of your bases covered without doing much tech work, right? Yeah. Um, so someone is asking, one password and last pass, are they subject to subpoena? Like, can police take our phones and compel us to give the password? I don't... Yes, please, please everyone, correct. every... Any any application that you uh, interact with or like give that sort of level of trust to, they are subject to subpoena by the U.S. government. Definitely, but the, but the like the goal then is when you're choosing these platforms, you want to make sure that they have encrypted servers. That's like a sort of keyword to look for because what that means is that if they are issued a subpoena for their records, the records themselves are basically useless as long as they have good encryption in place. That's great, um, and I I also think to, sorry. Um, no, no. That if the what so the question's asking about a subpoena and then says if the police take our phones and they can't compel you to give a password, but they can use biometrics to open your device. Whether or not it's legal, I'm not totally sure, but there has been precedent and like ongoing legal battles, which we can also include resources about about uh, protesters and folks being arrested being compelled to use like facial biometrics to open phones and their fingerprints. So. Just like yeah. a, a numeric based password, if you have that, and even if you are forced to open that by the cops, um, that will not hold up in court. Uh, there, it is illegal for them to do that, and they still do it. So right. like, let that be said. Also, there are ways, usually on almost all phones, to trigger that your phone locks in a way that can't be opened by your face um, without having to go deep into the settings. Um, research that. Like, it's, called like a, it's, called, it's often called like a hard lock. Um, and if you have like a good numeric passcode, then like that'll be the way you have to get in. Um, also, let it be said that if your devices are seized, um, the like sort of deeper forensic analysis um, like uh, capabilities that like law enforcement um, has are much, much, much more sophisticated than just like looking into your apps and looking into like the records. Um, and uh, uh, yeah, I, I don't want to like fear monger, but like, um, yes, forensic analysis is is very, very, very difficult to get past and very, very, very difficult to protect yourself against more than just like refusing to give sensitive information to those devices. Right. And again, it's just all harm reduction, just all putting steps in, steps into place to make our information harder to get when we don't want to give it. Um, Someone is asking, can we change the email associated with our Twitter account? I think so. I'm pretty sure I've done that before. Does anyone have anything? Yes. I think, okay. I think so. I have to double check. Yeah, we can double check that, but I'm pretty sure you should be able to do that and you'll just need to confirm with the new. You'll probably have to enter your password in um, and change the email address. Yes, I'm confirming you can. Yes. And someone's asking, for those of us who are very public advocates and can't hide our profile photos, names, is set any additional recommendations? Um, one that I can think of off of the top of my head is asking friends and family to take some of these security practices that maybe you can't if you're a very public facing person. Um, like people who want to hurt us often will take the route of hurting our families and loved ones. Um, so I think that's one thing that you could potentially do. I don't know if any 
if Daly or Milha have any other suggestions. Yeah, that's that's one that I was thinking about too, just um, asking your community to take the necessary measures to protect themselves. Other than that, um, I'm, nothing comes to mind. But I, I think too, what we were talking about is you can still cover your face potentially in, in public in certain spaces, depending on what you're doing and the, the level of, of risk. Um, you can potentially choose to leave your phone, use a different phone, um, have a burner device so that certain things can't be traced back to you even if you're sharing them. Um, someone is asking, is it okay to put our phone numbers into Authy? Um, yeah, go ahead, Daly. Uh, is it, I'm sorry, I think I heard it, Authy, like the Authenticator app, the MFA app? I think so, yeah. Okay, yeah. Um, is it okay to put your phone number in it? Uh, the, mm, Hmm. I'm not sure how to answer it because the question is a little loaded in different ways. Like I'm not, do you, do you mean like, are, is it safe to trust Authy with it? Or are there ways that like your phone number could be gleaned from that? I'm like, uh, there is an exchange of trust with using Authy as a service, right? Like you're trusting that their security posture is good enough that your shit won't be compromised if they get compromised, right? Um, I don't know. I haven't audited them very closely, but because they are so big, it like mm, sometimes with these bigger entities uh, like Google Authenticator or Authy, um, there is like a higher level of trust because they are um, they, just because they have the means and the resources to make it good, especially if their whole product is is yeah. based on security. And someone is saying, which I was just about to add, that you can make a free Google voice number as a like a burner number that you want. Um, and that's what I use for my work number is a Google voice number. And I change it when I like get uploaded to like escort directories that I don't want to be on and start getting calls that I don't want. Um, so you can use that. So I Currently, I have two devices, one that's just set up with a Google voice number and Wi-Fi and, the, and has no other identifying information about me on it, um, and like a burner email. I also have like a million emails, uh, many of which have nothing to do with my legal name, my worker name, or anything remotely related to me. So I think when thinking of aliases, you can have more than one. Yeah, Google Voice number is also good for um, obscuring your like most common phone number from like your Signal account because Signal requires phone number as of right now. They're working on a feature where it's user base named or username. Yeah. Based. Uh, but until then, you do have to give a phone number. So you you can like yeah obfuscate. Yep. Yeah. So like my Signal is connected to a Google Voice number, so that's like two different layers as well. Um, someone is asking, my Samsung has aggressive caller ID when I text. I use Google Voice now, but it does drop first, middle, last names. I can't figure out where on Android to get rid of it. I feel like that's the device name. Is it the, sharing the name of your device? Because I've, I'm not sure. Does anyone have any? It's worth changing both of those. It's worth looking into how, like, what type of, how your caller ID is being shared and your device name, and that would be specific to your device. I def like I can guarantee that that is something you'll get a lot of uh, um, results from if you just do like some web searching with like your spe your specific device, the um, the specific Android operating system version that you're using. I also wonder if you couldn't call Samsung and just ask them if they could change it. I'm not totally sure of like what number you have on your phone bill, what name you have under the number. Mm -hmm. uh, someone is asking, do you trust web browsers like Firefox in its security and privacy capabilities with their password manager as well? Uh, somewhat, yes. Firefox is more minded towards privacy and security than other browsers. Um, uh, certainly more so than Chrome. Chrome is easier to use and like a bit safer, I guess. Well, okay, let me rephrase this. Chrome has better security in place because they have Google's security teams on their side. Firefox is more privacy focused because their profits aren't driven by siphoning up data like Google is. 
Um, they're not an advertising company, Google is. Uh, um, for any browser that you use, always, always, always get into the browser settings itself and off the privacy and security settings there, much like Milka showed with the, with the social media accounts. There'll be very similar sort of pages on the browser. Do the same sort of thing there by like advancing those settings and use browser extensions and plugins that are specific to privacy and security. Some privacy ones like Privacy Badger and uBlock, not just because I'm a developer on Privacy Badger at EFF, but it is like it is a great tool. Um, uh, those Can we are add those into the resource list daily? Uh, I will, yes. Great. Um, and so the, those are good for like third party tracking and like getting yourself accidentally doxxed by like algorithms on social media, like, you know, suggested friends things. Then there are things like security tools like NoScript that are um, more about like preventing malicious code from being run on your browser. Great. And Thank I'll you. add those all to the resource list. Thank you. Um, someone is asking if we can elaborate on what I think this was for me for screenshotting images. Um, so something else you can do is in your camera settings, you can turn off the metadata and make sure that the location services aren't being recorded from your camera as well. Um, so what I was saying is so like if you take a photo on Instagram and then add a sticker over a protester's face, it's very possible that that sticker could be removed. But if you take a screenshot of it, you're making a new compressed image that that can't be removed from. And please, Daily or Milha, correct me if that's if there's anything you want to add to that. Um, I've included some resources in the doc for how to remove metadata. But a screenshot could also just be an extra step. I think so, but I'm not 100% sure. Okay. Maybe, well, maybe. It, it is for a lot of things. Yeah, um, the screenshot itself can like, depending on how your device is configured, can put its own sort of metadata but it is a good way to flatten out other things. Like if you're looking at like a, like maybe you're looking at like a PDF or some other like very, you know, um, uh, media rich text document, that in itself can be like, it, you know, can reveal a lot more information than you tend to, especially lawyers and stuff. If you're like redacting information, which lawyers get wrong all the time, um, they'll share the PDF with like the, the redacted information, like get it. <laughs> So a good way to flatten that out is just to take a screenshot of it. Awesome, thank that you. That makes sense. Um, Dale and Milha, uh, I just combined your names. Daly and Milha, I wanna check in with you. We have five minutes to go. I'm happy to stay on a few minutes longer to get through all of these questions. Are, do both of you have hard deadlines? Um, I'm, I have a pretty hard deadline just because okay. I have a really full day. Okay, um, cool, so we'll start wrapping up. Um, okay, so I can linger for a little bit as well. Um, I mean, I, I can linger for a little bit if, if people want. Also, I just wanted to say if you want to feel free to reach out to my email if you have any lingering questions daily at EFF.org. Okay, so I'm just we're going to keep the recording going Milha when you have to go. Thank you so much for your time. Can we get like a like a little round of applause for everyone in the in the chat and we'll just keep going through these questions until daily and I both have to go. Okay, I'm seeing some people raising their hands. We're gonna go through a couple more questions right now. Everyone, thank you so much for coming. Like, we really believe that uh, digital security is a community, a form of community care. So thank you for taking care of yourselves and for taking care of each other. Um, I'm gonna keep reading questions to just go through this. Someone's asking how they can donate to support for sharing this info. I would love any donations to go to uh, Black Visions Collective. That would be great. Uh, we're going to be paying our teachers and the remainder of the money will be going to a similar organization. Um, someone is asking any advice. If you have detailed info that's on a private static site, not like one of those spooky address sites, any advice for removing info from that? I'm sorry, can you repeat the question? Oh, okay. Um, any advice for removing detailed info that's like on a private static site? So I think it is like for an example, if someone's released your address or potentially like old escorting information, like how to remove that. Ooh, I defer to daily on this one. <laughs> um, yeah, I'm not sure what kind of site we're talking about here. Um, uh, 
I can depending say on the type of information that's being shared, it's like it's chances are it is illegal for them to share it. So um, you can threaten with litigation. People are always scared of lawyers and whatnot. Contact the site administrators, depending on the type of site it is. Um, they should like they have very strict rules in place for how they have to manage these types of things that happened. <laughs> Content moderation is a thick issue. Um, uh, yeah, I guess it depends on the type of site. Well, and what were you gonna yeah. say, Blanche? Oh, I was just gonna say sometimes like you can threaten legal action, and sometimes they just fucking ignore you. So sometimes like you can use search engine optimization to get other links higher. Most people, I think it's something like only like two percent of people ever look at the second page of Google. So like you're much more secure if you can just push that information back on the search engine as another form of harm reduction. Um, someone's asking. It, it also depends on how you're being targeted, right? Like if you're. Yeah. Eh, if if they're really coming after you individually, um, uh, it won't matter that you're going to be on the second page of results, right? It like they'll. Mm, it's hard to say. It really depends on the type of site, and if it's if it is a pretty severe or targeted attack, um, and you're not comfortable dealing with it yourself, this is definitely like a community response type of thing you want to have in place. Contact your contact your trusted networks and contact people like us um, to like help you. Yeah, definitely feel free to reach out and we'll help where and when we can. Um, someone is asking, can you scrub EXIF data from videos too? Um, before we answer that question, I got to run, but thank I'm you. so appreciative. Um, thank you, Blunt, for hosting this. Thank you, Daily. I learned a lot too. And I just want to say I appreciate you all. I'm proud of you all for taking the steps necessary to keep y'all safe. Take yeah, care. and and thank both of our presenters for putting this together in twelve hours. Uh, <laughs> we wanted to do it before Pride Month started, so thank you for that <laughs> very quick turnaround. Bye. Take care of yourself, Milha. You're um, awesome, Milha. Thank you. Thanks, thank you. <laughs> Peace and love, y'all. Yeah. Um, there will be speaking of like Pride Month. There's going to be a series of resources coming out on. I know I keep saying I'm here of my own volition, but like you know, this is a lot of my day job too. Um, there were releasing resources throughout the month of June on EFF.org for like pride specific concerns and security. Um, okay, so we we're talking about scrubbing data from videos too. Uh, yes, their metadata is, is, uh, on data files, um, it can be a little more wieldy to try and scrub them off than just like an image because there are just there's different types of video, there are different file types for videos that like are often more like metadata rich. So um, I would, it's, I, I would do like a case by case sort of basis for that, like check like the um, the file extension type, if it, like you look at the end of like the the particular thing you're looking at, like is it is it like an MP4 or is it like a dot move or something? Um, look at what type of file it is, and then just do like a quick uh, web search on like Google or DuckDuckGo or someone to see how you can get metadata off of it. And something else that you mentioned briefly in the chat, which I just wanted to offer as an option, and is like is doing a gur a gurgle a google search of yourself like it could be a very emotional experience i'd super recommend doing it with community with a friend who maybe knows both of your names and they can like act as a doula because sometimes you'll find shit that you didn't know was there um but like potential like if you're using the same image on your worker profile and on your activist profile, it's very possible that you can do a reverse image Google search. And that's also a way that folks find out information about you that maybe you didn't know was there. So um, sometimes it's helpful just to like really be able to see and understand the ways that this information can be found and the ways that you can work to um, make that, that link a little bit more difficult. Um, again, uh, Def if you need emotional support doing that, I definitely highly recommend it. And doing that in community with um, friends can be helpful. 
Um, someone's asking, does printing to a PDF on a desktop work as well as screenshotting? I think if you're physically printing it and then copying it, that's fine. But I know sometimes things can be removed on PDF files. So that happens all the time, right, Daily? Uh, I'm not. I'm not sure I understand the question. I think they were talking about screenshotting so that you can't, the cops can't remove or a bad actor can't remove something that's blocking something out. Okay. Uh, uh, right. So, um, yeah, taking a screenshot of a PDF will like sort of flatten out the layers of the PDF that can, that can be like um, extracted from each other and more information can be taken from them. Uh, so that is one way. Um, as you mentioned, like physically printing it is uh, is another way of like, uh, you know, keeping a sort of <laughs> a data file. <laughs> it's like a piece of paper. <laughs> uh, and sometimes even that, can, like, depending on your particular context or situation, that in itself can be, um, uh, that can identify who you are, where you come from. Mm -hmm. Sometimes there are like watermarks or signatures that are made by printers themselves. Um, uh, I, I'm sorry to give like vague answers, but a lot of these are very case by case or contextual bits. Um, yeah. Totally. Um, someone's asking, give me one sec. Looking into burners for work, but I wasn't where to, sure where to start. I was afraid, didn't want to ask which phone. I don't want to give my personal info, but I'm looking for a smartphone that I can access the sites I post on ads on as well as for just communicating. Um, I've, been, I've been using an iPhone. You can, I feel like used iPhones are fairly affordable. That's just hooked up to Wi-Fi um, with a Google voice number that's linked to Signal and just using, only using that device um, to do your work stuff. I hope, I think that might answer the question. Um, I think that's most of the questions right now. Um, I'm going to take one second to see if there's anything else that we can answer in the main main chat. Um, and thank you guys so much for taking the time to to be here and do this work in community together. Um, great, cool. Ooh, um, oh, can, uh, suggestion that. Ken Montenegro just put in the chat. Um, thanks, Ken. You're great. I think yeah. I follow you on Twitter. I think you're I, really think I do too. Yeah, feel free to send some of these links <laughs> to us to help us yeah. out. We were planning um, on uploading this to YouTube because this is all fairly public information. Webreporter.io, um, I don't know it, but we should check it out. Oh, you're so um, sweet. <laughs> okay, um, and please, uh, Please feel free to follow up with us. Um, we're really trying to make uh, webinars and trainings that are really needed by community rather than what we think people may need, because uh, you guys know best what, <laughs> what you need. So feel free to reach out and let us know what we could do, what we could do better. Um, this one was planned very last minute uh, with everything going on. So we wanted to offer immediate harm reduction advice uh, and Feel free to follow up with us in email if there are any specific needs that you think might be more generalized, generalizable to the general uh, community that we work with. Yeah, and I, I just wanna also like reiterate again that a lot of this practice is easier than you think, and it is like a continual practice. It's, it's sort of like any other sort of like hygienic thing. Yeah. But it, like do it over time, develop a ritual out of it, and it's, um, uh, it's easier than you think. I know, and I also, I, Daily's helped me so much with my own digital security practices and just having, like, even when I, like, Daily will teach me something and then I'll teach someone else something. And I think that that pattern of, like, information flow is really helpful in community. So if you learn something here and you want to, like, call someone who wasn't on this call and be like, yo, I just learned this thing. Like, let's sit down with our devices and see what we can do to, like, strengthen our security. That's sort of what we mean by community care as well. Um, and it's also just like psychologically easier for me personally. I can only speak from my own experience. Um, but yeah, thank you so much for taking the time to be here. We wish you all 
safe protesting um, and happy Pride Month. Take care, everyone.